السلام عليكم ورحمه الله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على اشرف المرسلين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك وحبيبك ونبيك سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم so today inshallah we will start with surah al hujurat surah al hujurat is a madani surah we choose in this course two surahs one is makki surah qaf and one is madani surah al hujurat and the purpose behind that to show you the characteristics of the makki surahs and the features of madani surahs anything revealed to rasulullah sallam before migration to medina called makki surahs anything after migration even in mecca called madani surahs surah al hujurat is madani and madani has certain features Number one, for example, you'll find Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu a lot in Madani surahs. Because it deals with a community in Medina and all the problems and challenges that community face in that time. So the surahs came to organize this community, to guide them. Madani surahs also has a lot of commands or the rules in Sharia vast majority of them revealed in Medina, not in Mecca. Because the main purpose in Mecca is, to, is about explaining the concepts in Islam, especially Iman, especially the patience, the wisdom behind the test, all of these things. The Day of Judgment, prepare Muslims for the commands which will reveal later. Because the difference between Sahaba and the generations after them, especially nowadays, is Sahaba, when they heard the commands, they have a strong belief. They love Allah wa more than anyone else. So that high level of love, when they receive any commands, straight away, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا we hear and we obey. Nowadays, because we're born as Muslims, we inherit Islam. So we, some of us see commands as something very difficult, very heavy. Okay, why all of this? Why that? So the method of Quran is, when you know Allah Taala and you know His names, attributes, you love Him. When His commands come to you, you'll be very grateful that he care about you and give you a command. So Madani surahs have a lot of commands. Rasulullah sallam, he lived in, lived in Medina for 10 years. These 10 years, nearly uh, 24 surahs revealed in this 10 years. But four of them is one is Baqarah, Ali Imran, and Nisa al Ma'ida, which is very long. Surah Al Anfal, Surah Al Tawbah, some long surahs, Madani, long surahs. This surah Al Hujurat is one of the latest surahs revealed to Rasulullah. It revealed to Rasulullah in the year 9 of Hijrah. It means just one year and few months before that Rasulullah passed away. It's very late. So these surahs very late come now to give latest also commands to the community. There's a reason behind this. There's a, a situation happen, incident in Medina that this surah revealed to Rasulullah That year nine in Hijrah is very important year in the life of Rasulullah Sallam. Because Rasulullah Sallam conquered Mecca in the year 8. And all the Arab in Arabia, they are waiting for the result of the conflict between Rasulullah Sallam and his tribe Quraysh. They said, if one of them win in this conflict, then we'll be with them. So after 20 years of this conflict, Rasulullah Sallam one and he conquered Mecca and all the people of Quraysh, they convert to Islam. 
Now the Arab in the Arabia said, okay, now everything is clear. Now we will convert to Islam. So that year after Mecca, year 9, Rasulullah sallam sit in Medina, and every time he would receive a delegation from different tribe in, in, in Arabia. They came to convert to Islam. So in that, in that year, he received a delegation from, from Najd in Bani Tamim. Najd now is where, where the Riyadh, the capital of Saudi now, that's called Najd. These tribe came to Rasulullah late. They convert to Islam very late. And one of the main tribes there is Banu Tamim. So Banu Tamim came to Rasulullah Sallallahu And when they came, one of their leaders, Al-Aqra'u ibn Habis, one of their leaders, and these people also are very harsh. A lot of these followers are Bedouin. So when they came to Rasulullah Sallallahu they came after Dhuhr. So they say, where is Rasulullah Sallallahu They say, he has a rest in one of his houses. Where is his houses? They see very simple houses called Hujurat. Hujurat is the houses of Rasulullah We come to that, the term Hujurat. So they say, where is the houses of Rasulullah They say, it's there over there. So this leader come and he shout, Oh Muhammad Come out, I want to talk to you in this harsh way. And Rasulullah is taking rest after Dhuhr. So he shout very loudly. That's one of the reasons of this surah. This surah main theme is etiquette and manners, ethics of Muslims. How they deal with Rasulullah How we deal with, our, with each other. So it's mainly about ethics and manners. Also, another incident that this Bedouin, they claim that they have high status in Iman. A'rab means Bedouin. Bedouin. So the Bedouin said, no, we have, we have high level in Iman. So Surah came down to teach them and teach the companions and, and teach us that when you claim that you are mu'min, there is a lot of implication here. And there's a difference between you are just Muslim, it means you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you do the five pillars of Islam, you still in the basic. There's a lot of things, when you do it, that will increase your iman and get a high level. And one of the main these things, how you deal with people. How you deal with people indicate and symbolize your level in Iman. So one of the main theme of Surah here, which Muslims need nowadays, is the connection between Iman and the morals and ethics. How we deal with people indicate our level of Iman. Because when you submit to Allah, ta'ala, you will accept all His commands. And one of the main commands in this surah is about, is about how we deal with each other, how we treat people. This is one of the essence of Iman. Surah came to remove that misconception may some Muslims have. They thought that Muslim, it means just Five, the Islam is five the pillars of Islam, that's it. You can find some Muslims nowadays, they pray in the first arrow. They pray in the first row in, in the masjid. The first row, they rush to Umrah many times during the year. They give zakat, they fast every Ramadan, they go to Hajj, but they have problem. When they deal with people, it seems they became different people. When they deal with business, easy for some of them is to cheat, deceive, to lie. The same person who attend the mosque five times a day. These people, when they deal with their spouses, they became different people. 
They become very harsh. They don't deal in, in, in Islamic way. So what's the problem here? This surah, one of the main purpose is to emphasize this problem, to deal with this problem. Iman is not only certain of belief. Iman is not five pillars of Islam only. Iman should affect you that when you deal with people, deal in the best way. So that's why he starts with, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. Then he will say to the Bedouins, don't say we are, we are, we are, we are mu'mins. You are still Muslims. If you want to be mu'mins, which is high level, then treat people in a good manner. So that's one of the main themes here. Surah Al-Hujurat is only 18, 18 ayahs, 18 verses. Only 18 ayahs. However, it's very important. This, there's five ayat here, five verses start with, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. O you who believe, O believers. Because it emphasizes the iman is one of the main central theme here. Five times, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. And after this five times, Ya ayyuhal nas. That's amazing. That's five times, Oh, you, oh, who you believe, O oh, believers, and then after this five times, O oh, mankind, universal call. What's that? Look at the name, Hujurat. Hujurat is a plural. The singular is Hujra. Hujra literally is a room. The room called Hujra. But we have another term in Quran for room, which is ghurfa. In Arabic, we can call any room ghurfa or hujra. But there is a slight difference. And this is a methodology of Quran. If there is any terms that it's similar in Arabic, when it's in the Quran, there's a slight difference. That's the uniqueness of the Qur'an. He will use that just for a certain thing and use the other with, with the with other thing else. Allah used ghurfa in all Qur'an for Jannah. And he used hujurat, hujra here, to talk about the house of Rasulullah in dunya. Why he do that? Because ghurfa, even in Arabic, and Hujra is slightly different. Ghurfa is a room, but room not in the ground floor. In the first floor, second floor, that's called Ghurfa. But if it's in the ground floor, called Hujra. So if it's ground floor, this is Hujra. If it's above that, first or second, this is Ghurfa. Jannah is amazing. Anything in Jannah, he will not say ground floor. No, Jannah is amazing, luxury houses. So he always used the word ghurfa when he talk about Jannah. Ghurfa, ghurufat, ghuraf, fil ghurufati aminun. So, but when he talk about the houses of Rasulullah Sallam, he said he used hujurat. Because the houses of Rasulullah Sallam in dunya are very simple. He chose to live this life very simple. And now when you go to the Medina, for example, there is a theater where you go there, you can find the, how the, the, the rooms of Rasulullah and his houses it look like. You can go to the YouTube now, you'll find it easily. So it's just a very simple room divided to a bedroom and just the second half is just a living room. And it's very simple. That Al-Hassan al-Basri said when he was adult, he, when he, I raise my hand, I can touch the roof. Very simple houses. So it's hujurat. It's hujurat. But the question, why this surah called hujurat? You may say, obvious, because the incident happened that those Bedouin came and speak loudly and shout to Rasulullah 
come out from Hujurat. That's right. But in Quran, out of experience, that every single name of Surah, if it's from Rasulullah Sallam, there's something deeper behind the name. So for example, if I say Surah Al-Baqarah, why is Surah Al-Baqarah called Baqarah, the cow? You'll answer because the story of the cow. That's right. But there's something deeper than that. Because the story of the cow is just one page. And there is a lot of themes in Surah Al-Baqarah more important than the story of the cow. So why the story of the cow? Because when you look at Surah Al-Baqarah deeply, you can join all the themes in Surah Al-Baqarah and relate it to the story of the cow. It just needs deep reflection. So Surah Al-Baqarah, for example, just for the story of the cow is the mistakes of the people of the book before us. Surah Al-Baqarah can divide it to two main passages. The first juz, Ya Bani Israel, Ya Bani Israel, is about the people of the book before us. The second juz, Laysa al-birra an tuwallu wujuhakum, is about the commands to this ummah. Very obvious two main passages. And between the two main passages, there's three pages about turning Qibla from Palestine to Mecca. So here how you combine all of this. That he start with the first passage, the mistakes of the people before us. Because this ummah, the ummah of Rasulullah now will take the leadership. This is the last ummah. So before you take the leadership, you should learn from the mistakes of the people before you. And we can summarize these mistakes in the story of the cow. So when you hear the story of the cow, that's the mistakes. Take the mistakes before you take the leadership. When you finish this passage, we go to a turning qibla. Why in the middle? And it's in the middle exactly. Like when Allah said, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا this ayah is ayah number 143. 143 times 2, it's 286, which is in the half of Baqarah. Turning Qibla symbolizes turning leadership from the people of the book before us to the Ummah of Rasulullah wasallam. And then the commands come. So when you say Surah Al-Baqarah, I should learn mistakes. What's the main mistakes? The main mistake, they don't submit to Allah. They don't say, Sami'na wa ata'na. They don't glorify the Lord. Even when they talk, they say to Musa, Ud'u lana rabbak. Ask your Lord. They didn't say, our Lord. They say, your Lord. Every time, Ud'u lana rabbak, Ud'u lana rabbak. Ask your Lord. Compare this with the dua of believers in the end of Baqarah. Rabbana, la tu'akhidna in nasina wa akhtana. Rabbana, wa la tahmil alayna isran kama hamalta ala ladhina min qablina. Rabbana, wa la tuhamilna three times. And in the beginning is three times. But this Rabbaka, your Lord, here Rabbana. We are very proud, very grateful to relate to Allah, to say Rabbana. So, that's an example of a deeper conne- uh, reflection of the name. Here, Surah Al-Hujurat, the houses of Rasulullah Because of that incident, when you say Al-Hujurat, straight away, I will remember the incident of the Bedouin. What's the main problem of the Bedouin? There's no etiquette. Then the main theme of this Surah is about etiquettes and manners. That's number one. Number two, when you say hujurat, hujurat usually it means a rooms. It means seems we talk about a house, one house, and inside that one house there is rooms. What does that mean? Surah talk about the house of believers. It seems all we 
all of us as a believers we live in one house the house of Islam inside that house there is a lot of rooms we should fix our problems inward problems first before we come out from that house and call other people to Islam we should organize we should treat ourselves in the best manner we should know where's the border how we should treat each other if we get that we come out from the house that's why Allah said ya ayyuhan nas then we can call people to Islam when we fix our problems that's why this surah is so relevant like the old Quran as I said in the beginning of this series that the key if you want to reflect upon Quran the most important advice is read Quran as a relevance to your time if you do that that's the most important key if you don't find relevance of Quran it means that's just a lack of reflection and when you find that you will love Quran because it's relevance for you people they don't have that too much relationship with Quran because they don't see it as a relevance it's just a book about history talk about something very good but when you read as a relevance you will see you will open your eyes for everything now this surah is so relevant because talk about the conflict between Muslims itself always the unity is one of the main theme in Quran now our ummah we have a lack of unity between societies communities countries this surah give us the solution give us the solution in this year you have ladina amanu five times that's why it's very very important it's a hujurat it's the rooms of the house of muslim before we call people out to the islam 18 surah surah start with this a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim يا أيها الذين آمنوا this type of call يا أيها الذين آمنوا we should repeat a lot in Quran Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said if you heard يا أيها الذين آمنوا in Quran pay extra attention because Allah called us O believers this is our identity our idea that we are believers we believe we submit to Allah so when we heard this then it's now we'll pay extra attention our Lord call us with our identity here ya amanu. and he said after that La Inna Allah sami'un alim La tuqaddimu bayna yaday Allah wa rasulih It's very unique expression in Arabic That's why when I look at the translations they they, they, they they try to come across to this It's difficult to translate it literally to English Because it's an expression in Arabic if you want to translate it literally, you will say لا تقدموا, don't come forward in front of Allah and the Messenger. That's the literally. Because it's an ex expression. لا تقدموا. The expression here is don't proceed your opinion, your preferences, your, or your saying or statement in front of the Sharia, in front of Allah and His messengers. What does that mean? It means the first ayah here said, Iman, Islam, and means submission. When you submit to Allah, wa it means don't prioritize your opinions, your tendencies, your preferences, your state, your anything before the commands of Allah and His messenger. We should know our limit. We are believers. What does believers mean? It means سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا It means if you want to deal with business, you should ask what did Allah said and His Messenger? What about this type of business? 
So, because you are a believer, لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله. There's another behind that, a deeper meaning here is, what's your priority? What's your sources when you talk knowledge or when you do anything in this life? Is Quran and Sunnah. Quran and Sunnah is a source of any believers. What Allah said and His messengers, this is the sources of, of all the Muslims. So he starts with this because he will talk about a lot of manners and ethics and conflict between Muslims. So he want to say to us, if you are believers and you submit to Allah, wa ta'ala, then don't forget your identity. You are believers. Anything Allah said and his messengers, you should straight away prioritize that. And he said, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ Fear Allah. Taqwa is a Quranic word. Sometimes they translate it, fear Allah, be mindful, be conscious. Taqwa is a big word because it's mentioned in the first command in the Quran. اعبدوا ربكم الذي خلقكم والذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون. You want to say that every type of ibadah should lead to taqwa. It means any physical form of ibadah. If not lead you to consciousness, to, to be mindful, it means there is a lack here. So if you pray and you don't think that prayer, don't increase your iman, don't think during the prayer of the azamah and jalal of Allah, it means there's a big problem here. So he says, وَاتَّقُوا Allah. But he chose these two names. Inna Allah has sami'un, all hearing, alim, all knowing. He could choose any names of his beautiful names. But these two names here, after it Allah, sami' it means Allah is all hearing. It means whenever you say, either you are alone, that I want to do this, I want to do that, even against Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah is hearing everything. Allah is knowing everything. So you are a believer. Basically, this first ayah is just an introduction to the surah. Listen, you are a believer, listen to what Allah will say in this surah, because this is the etiquette and manners of the Islam. So etiquette and manners, the central point that we are believers. So we treat our spouses, because Allah said that, treat our neighbors, non-Muslims, anyone in this life. So after this introduction, he repeat again, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. Now we'll start with the manners with the leader of our ummah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The best of mankind. يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا ترفعوا أصواتكم فوق صوت النبي ولا تجهروا له بالقول كجهر بعضكم لبعض أن تحبط أعمالكم وأنتم لا تشعرون Believers, don't raise your voices above the voice of Rasulullah Subhanallah. Look how Rasulullah is in high status. That Allah Taala mentioned in a lot in Quran how we can deal with Rasulullah Treat Rasulullah in different manner. This is a special person. This is the messenger of Allah. This is the one who Allah chose to be the last messenger and the mercy for all mankind. Don't raise their, your voice in his presence. Don't shout to them. Don't speak loudly as you speak to one another. After this ayah, the Sahaba, when they speak to Rasulullah, he said, can you please raise your face? I can't hear you. Because they're afraid about this ayah. When Abu Bakr, this ayah revealed, he said, by Allah, I will never speak to you, O Messenger. Just like the speak when one friend wants to tell secret to 
his friend, so to speak, very quietly. Because there is, there is, a, there is a big warning here. Say, if you don't do that, your good deeds may be cancelled, may be, become void, become waste. This is a big warning. Just because you don't respect Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the companions, he used to have a loud voice. Qais ibn Thabit ibn Shammas. He's from Ansar. His voice is naturally louder. So he has louder voice. So when he heard this ayah, he went to his house and he said to his wife, I will never come out in any public gathering with Rasulullah Because I'm afraid about this ayah. I can't control my voice. What if I speak loud in his presence? So he spent few days, he didn't go to the mosque. So Rasulullah asked about him. Where, where? So ask, he said, so he sent some of his companions. He said, I can't because he said, call him. He said, you are not from these people because this is just your nature. You can't do it. Just look at how the Sahaba received the commands of Allah and his messenger. Because of that love, of that respect, glorification of Allah in their hearts. So, what about us nowadays? How can we respect Rasulullah Sallallahu like this? For example, in the time of Umar, when Umar was Khalifa, he saw two people, they came to give salam to Rasulullah Sallallahu in his grave. And they speak loudly. So Umar straight away tell one of his companions, bring to me these two people. You know Umar is very strict. Where are you from? We are from outside Medina, far away. If you are from Medina, I will punish you. How can you raise your voices next to Rasulullah Will you not listen to the ayah? وَلَا تَرْفَعُوا أَصْوَاتَكُمْ so he said, even when you come to his grave, sallallahu alayhi wa be quiet. Respect him. That's one of the manifests of this ayah. The other manifest also is about the seerah of Rasulullah sallam and the hadith of Rasulullah sallam. If raising voice in his presence is a big sin, what about if we neglect his life and seerah at all? Is that more disrespect? So the ayah just indicate you should respect Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It means out of respect, we should know him first. We should study his seerah. We should teach our children his life in details. Details. Sometimes some come and I ask young people, in my doors, do you study seerah? Alhamdulillah, I study seerah. Did you read a full book in Sirah? Oh, it's very rare. Did you watch a whole series? Very rare. But I know Sirah. Okay, Bismillah. I ask them very basic questions about the family of Rasulullah. They don't know. 200 years ago, in my country, Mauritania, there is a group of people, they study, start studying. Could, you can say in Darul Ulum, we call it in Mauritania Mahadir. And they went in, in a journey in the desert. They feel thirsty, they found a tent. They came to that tent, there is an old woman, one of the scholars in the past, that woman. So the woman asked them, what do you want? We want some water. She said, I want to ask you one question about your Prophet If you answer, I'll give you water. They said, one question, ask 100 questions. She said, no, it's just one. She said, can you tell me the name of the grandmother of Rasulullah from mother's side and father's side? No one of that group can answer the question. Then the old woman said, can you tell me, every one of you, what's the name of your grandmother? So obviously they all told their so she said, who is more beloved to you? Yourself 
or the Prophet You should strive to know everything about him. You just need to read. One of this group called Ahmad al-Majlisi, he decided from that moment that he will read every single book about Rasulullah And then he wrote later, he wrote two poems. These two poems till nowadays, it's the, our scholars teach the children till nowadays these two poems. And when you memorize these two poems and know the meaning, you'll know many, many details about Rasulullah Sallallahu The first one called Nazmul Ghazawat, it's in the internet. It's around 500 lines. And the second is Amudun Nasab. 1,277 lines. It's about the life of Rasulullah in details. And when he come to mention the name of the mother of Rasulullah he mentioned his mother and grandmother and grandmother and grandmother till six. And he mentioned this name because he, oh, his mother, grandmother from father's side is Fatima bint Amr al makhzumiya And from mother's side is Barra bint Abdul Uzza. The point here is, respect of Rasulullah is to learn as much as you can about his life. It's to teach your children. Nowadays, we have a lot of good cartoons. For those children three years old, four years old, instead of they waste their time with the tablets, with, with stuff, no benefit, just bring the cartoon to them and let them watch. And there's a lot of experience of people I know that they, their children, they just memorize the seerah by the cartoons. And the amazing thing, thing, if you do that cartoon in Arabic, in Fusha, they will learn Arabic and cartoon and the seerah. They will learn seerah, sorry, and Arabic together. That's out of the respect. Raising the voice in his presence is a major sin. What about neglect his life? What about neglect to reading his sunnah? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he said, don't raise your voice. Don't speak to him loudly like you speak to one another. If you do that, be aware. May your good deeds will cancel, will be waste. Wa antum la tashur, and you don't aware about this. The third thing, that, that, then he, he continued in the same theme. He prays now those people. You talk about those Sahaba, they receive. Now he prays the people who speak quietly in his presence. It means they, they lower their voices. Usually is for the gaze. But he uses it here for the voice. To say, usually غض is just for something very soft, like the eyes, not with the voice. But he want to say, lower your voice. Make it very soft when you talk to Rasulullah Sallallahu Those who do that, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ امْتَحَنَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ This also expression. That was some translation they did it, they say tested. It's not tested. Imtahana is tested, but here is expression. It means that by it means they prove that their heart are sound. Because they speak quietly in the presence of Rasullah, that's a proof that their heart are sound. Amazing. Then Allah give them reward. Allah will give them forgiveness and great reward because they respect the Messenger of Rasulullah May Allah wa guide us to the straight path. May Allah wa give us ability to study the life of Rasulullah in details. May Allah wa out of our love to his Messenger وسلم, make us with our Messenger in Jannatul Firdaus. Wallahu alam wa sallallahu ala abdi Rasulullah Sayyidina Muhammad.